Welcome to Startup Dugout by Dell Technologies, a podcast series where we talk to entrepreneurs from India's biggest tech startups to go back to that time when. That time when you needed allies. That time when you needed sound advice and good mentors. That time when you were looking for the right tech partners who can accelerate growth. I'm Sairi Chahal, your host for the series. I'm a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and evangelist for women's internet. I currently run Shiro's and Mahila Mani to create internet ecosystems for women, helping them with employment, entrepreneurship, and access to capital. Through this show, we are going to discover how these industry leaders respond to challenges in their entrepreneurial journeys with their startups coming out stronger than ever, and how initiatives like Dell for Startups empower companies through innovative technology, strategic guidance, proven practical capabilities, and expert consulting assistance. In this episode, I speak with Mandeep Manocha, the co-founder and CEO of Cashify, a re-commerce marketplace. Officially founded in 2013, Cashify buys old electronic goods from consumers and resells them as refurbished devices. This way, the company contributes to the circular economy, reduces electronic waste and environmental damage, while increasing access to quality smartphones and other electronic devices at affordable prices. Mandeep's entrepreneurial journey began with him building a waste management company, a fitting predecessor to what Cashify is today. Mandeep and I discuss what it's like adapting a business idea through changing times, working in a trust deficit market, and coping with external factors like the recession or demonetization. So, Mandeep, let me ask you uh, a question that's been on my mind. We're in 2022. Everyone's talking about a down market. And, of course, uh, some of us have seen these cycles before in varying proportions. And you you are an entrepreneur who started in recession. And uh, 2008, 2009, probably one of the hardest we have seen so far. Tell us what are things an entrepreneur needs to know when they start up in a recession. What are the lessons you took along the way? You know, this, this question really will take me back through the memory lane. It's been a long time. But I think, uh, you know, the first thought that come to my mind is, it is hard to convince people around you that why are you taking this call? Of course, it's a recession, but people still expect you to, you know, get a good job because they think that you are, you are the better one of the lot. But I, I can tell you both me and my co-founders didn't get a job at that time. So... The first thing that you have to do is, you know, you have to convince your parents, you have to convince your friends why you're doing this. A lot of people say that, you know, great companies have been, you know, started in recession times. But one thing that people don't tell you is that uh, it's really hard to find early believers during recession. Of course, it's true for any time, but even in, in the times of recession, you know, everybody's fighting their own battles. You know, everyone is down. They have, everyone is in survival mode. So getting the first customer, getting the first backers, it's really, really tough. But what is important is, you know, you need to just realize that this recession is going to get over at some point. So you have to give yourself time. Uh, maybe when you start in recession, you may have to budget another year or two. But I think the good thing is that you can only go up from there. Uh, you know, you are at the worst or the bottom of your uh, career at that time. So all you can think of is just going up and that takes off a lot of load from your head. You know, when you realize that you have nothing to lose more, then you can only think of, you know, I, I can just go up from here. So that it's is one, one. Yeah, it's liberating. So, you know, thankfully we, we were in a situation where we had to start in a recession because we had no other option. But I think it worked out pretty well for us. And I think... Uh, uh, even now that, you know, there are talks of recession, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will start of thinking or leaving their jobs or would be forced to leave their jobs. But it's not the end. I mean, we have seen these cycles every eight, ten years and, uh, you know, things change. We all, uh, always, you know, come back to the top. So uh, it's, it's great times for people who want to start. 
Wonderful and super inspiring. And I guess uh, good companies will continue to come out of uh, Absolutely. recessions. Absolutely. Uh, so you're a thesis-based entrepreneur. You know, you, you probably work in a space that's one of the most challenging issues of our time, climate change, environment, something that matters to all of us. And yeah. uh, being a, a mission-driven company myself, I I know what it takes. It's a, it's a hard road to, one, find a balance between commercial success and long-term vision. And of course, I think uh, there's always a trade-off, you know, staring at you between yeah. keeping your purpose and keeping your commercial success in line. Yeah. yeah. How did you navigate that? And, and of course, I think before Cashify, this idea already existed, right? I think Cashify is a germination of a lot of things that you probably walked through before before this happened. So yeah. walk us through the journey a little more and how did you get attracted to the whole idea of doing this? So I think uh, starting on, we were very clear that we want to build something in waste management. Now, if you ask me why did this idea germinate in your head? It was a very unsexy field. Not many people have been talking about it. Back in 2008, nine, it was still very, very nascent where people would you know, even think about it. My background goes where I've seen uh, my parents or my family work in a recycling kind of setup. So I've spent my you know, summer holidays just in scrapyards figuring out which metal is what. Not to boast, if you give me five metals, I can identify just by you know, picking them up that this is iron, this is copper, this is magnesium. So that is where, you know, I had an initial, uh, you know, uh, exposure to what recycling is. And when I graduated, I felt that, you know, uh, nowhere in the world, uh, there is a industry or there is a setup which can boast that we are the recycling hub for the world. You know, there are IT hubs for the world. India is the back end when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, call centers, etc. for the longest time. China has been the manufacturing hub for the world, but there was no recycling hub in the world. So that is where we started the idea that can we build the largest recycling setup anywhere in the world, which could be which could encompass everything, solid waste, electronic waste, etc. And that is how we felt that let's start. We wanted to start with solid waste because that is something that comes very naturally to all of us. We see solid waste every day. You know, there's a dabba that goes out of our house every day. Right. And we generate so much waste. I mean, it's sure. it's funny that if you you don't take out your trash for five days, you realize how much consumerism is there in your own lives. It's 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 mind boggling. So we wanted to solve for it. And we felt that there is a lot of resource which just go live waste. Uh, we've all seen large, uh, you know, uh, dumping grounds in and outside of our cities and it's just it's just a problem that keeps building up there are mountains which have come uh, at places where there was nothing like five years ago True. so we wanted to solve for that and uh, we started our journey in uh, solid waste trying to figure out uh, what we can do it took us to places where uh, you know we could actually uh, see a solid waste management facility right next to a pig farm Interestingly, the pigs would actually eat all the biodegradable waste from the solid waste and what you would be left with something that you can actually sell. Okay. But we very soon realized it's a very uh, regulated industry. Uh, you know, you have to work a lot with the government to actually get those contracts. So we felt really flat initially that, you know, this is not something that we could do. Then we moved, you know, we did one project, very interesting project with Indian Railways where we thought, okay, if you look at any railway line when you're traveling, you see waste all across. Like I when know. you, you know, right next to the railway lines, you'll always see waste. So can we work with the railways to, you know, make sure that we clean everything? So that took us to a journey. We worked there for a few months, but then again, realized a lot of red tapeism. We can't build a large company there. Finally, we chanced upon electronic waste uh, in our research. And we felt that, you know, this is something which not a lot of people are talking about. Not everyone is doing it and is going to be a big problem in the future. So we picked up that one topic, one you know uh, area, and delved deep into it. We started with a consulting uh, you know setup where we were working with all major OEMs to build their backend supply chain for waste management, especially electronic waste. And we were lucky to get a break with 
few of the largest uh, you know biggest brands in smartphones and laptops and uh, printers to work with them to build their supply chains so we did that for a couple of years and then you know again you know entrepreneurs itch can we make it really large we could not so we shelved that and then we moved to uh, you know an, an idea where uh, we would collect scrap tires and convert them into oil and oh, that's wow. where my chemical ba- engineering background you know came into some kind of help and we ran you know we set up one of india's first rubber to oil uh, pyrolysis unit uh, in in north north india and we ran that for 2 years uh, you know ma- made that uh, whole setup profitable but then soon realized that if you need to scale a manufacturing setup you have to put in capital uh, in a proportionate manner and uh, do we want to do this all our lives or we've learned whatever we had to from this setup so we took a call that let's sell this and uh, build something which is more digital and this is where 2013 14 we are talking about wherein you know a lot of e-commerce was happening a lot of digital companies were coming into picture and the scale that we could see was much much higher and what you could achieve or make an impact was much larger and that is where the idea of you know cashify came into existence wherein we realized that in the recycling domain one step before is uh, reuse so you know when you say reduce reuse recycle reducing your consumption is the first step reusing what you have is the second step and the final frontier is recycling you said if we can build something in reuse and uh, you know make a large business out of it let's try to build that in electronic waste domain and interestingly you know one thing that we've realized in our recycling journey was that a device is not an e-waste till the time is lying in your drawer it will ultimately become that but if a phone if a blackberry device is lying in your drawer today it's not e-waste today till the time you throw it so if you could bring those you know assets back into the cir- circular economy before they you know reach the end of life we can actually you know juice out some of the usable life of that device and given that you know in a country like ours where people don't have access to electronics uh 50% of india is still using feature phone if we can extend the life cycle of the product which is lying in your drawers we can actually make it available and there'll be huge demand so that's how the idea of cashify came into existence but we've always been focused on the you know the fundamental that we will build something in waste management recycling and we are true you know whatever we are building and we have our plans in the future are you know uh, governed by this uh, initial fact that this is the space we want to be in wonderful what what a journey stick to the purpose and make many pivots and of course i think digital is where a lot of our uh, own liberation as founders lies and yes. uh, my next question leads me to that and of course i think when you go digital and we are building a company that's technology backed you need amazing partners you need reliable partners i know you you've been a dedicated uh, user of dell laptops in your organization and and you've scaled yeah. the organization using some of their expertise and and their products can you yeah. talk a little bit about that yeah i think this goes back to you know even our college days uh, you know there were a very few brands when it had to come to you know buying a laptop and the best differentiator was uh, you know dell had a amazing after service after sales support you know i remember even in college if anything had gone bad on a laptop you just make a call and the guy would come change the part and you were good to go you did not have to go out and find where the next you know where the service station is wait for you know 10 days for the part to come to the service station so that is something that you know was there in my mind and when we started it was very clear that whatever uh, it hardware that you want to use you want to use dell because see you don't want discontinuity in a business and it takes a takes away a lot of productivity and a founder's time because initially when you're building an org you are everyone you are the it guy you are the you know support staff so if somebody's laptop would break it's your problem you have to go out and find you know how do i get it repaired so that's where dell you know we chose dell because we knew that if anything goes wrong it's going to be taken care of and we always bought the extended uh, you know warranties of dell and it it made our lives very simple so this is just one very simple example that we you know use and since we've been using dell from day one we we we've stuck to it and most of our it hardware equipment that even we buy today is is from dell 
wonderful i think uh, it's good to have partners you can completely Absolutely. rely on and you yeah. don't need to worry about uh this brings me to my next question uh which is a little bit of a dichotomy in india on one side we are a country with 50% feature phones which means everybody probably needs the product that that you have for them but at the same time we are a high trust deficit market uh people still like the idea of a new product people still yeah. like guarantees uh how did you negotiate that how did you work through that So in our business trust is on the both sides. Uh on the side where we buy used devices from people and on the side where we sell. So let me talk about where is the trust deficit when we buy. You know, there are a lot of uh, C to C classified platforms where you can sell your product. Now a lot of these uh, you know a lot of customers we realize in our surveys that don't trust who they're selling their, you know, phone to. You know, where is it going to get used? The second thing is then when you're buying from a you know classified platform you don't know whether the product's going to work or not okay so on the sourcing side we had to build a uh, you know a lot of education that you can sell this device to cashify uh we will come to your doorstep pick it up you know no hassle plus you know where you're selling and you know it's not going to come back and haunt you ever in your life the second thing is people always you know think about data security that if i sell my phone to someone unknown and my data goes into wrong hands what will happen so we solved for trust there by telling people that you know uh we will do a data reset in front of you when we pick up the phone and at the same time when we go back to our warehouse we do a professional level data clean up so that your data is secure so that's on the trust side on the sourcing side on the demand side you rightly pointed out that we are in a segment where every device could be different you know if i keep 10 phones in front of you it's possible that one has a dent one does not one has a small blemish on the screen the other does not and it's very difficult to solve for it from a very digital perspective so our focus has been for the last 5 years to build the demand side in a very offline heavy fashion so we've invested in building a distribution and a retail chain you know retail presence and today we have about 130 retail stores of our own wow wherein you can go in and buy a refurbished product have a look and feel of it and then make the decision we believe that ultimately this business will grow digitally but i think the the step that we have to maneuver is building that trust by digital uh, by offline presence first and then once the trust is built you know you can expect customers to come online and start buying from you but it's a journey and i i think we are we are not very far from it within the next 12 to 24 months we believe that the market is going to evolve people have already started talking about refurbished products and if you go back 3 years nobody knew the word refurbished so i think we are there but it's still going to take some time where physical presence is important so we are doubling down i think our 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 next 12 month target is to open another 120 130 stores and take this number to 260 270 stores so we are we are going uh, you know step at a time offline and then digital super i think this is fascinating building a playbook for refurbished and my sense is that uh, it'll open up a lot of categories in a country like ours and of course in the end contributing to the circular economy and india has a yes. real chance there and they let me talk about one of the hardest phases perhaps for cashify demonetization something that you've often said almost killed the company and uh, how did you how did na- how did you navigate that uh what what turned out after demonetization did you make any major changes to how you work you know it's it's quite amusing uh, the day you know that happened and the moment i heard it i was very very happy you know that finally there's a positive change uh you know we used to think that a lot of our competition is the unorganized market who don't have to pay taxes you know who do everything in a shady manner so i thought okay great there's going to be a level playing field elated next day it dawned on me that okay all that is great but there's no money in the market now just imagine a company whose name is cashify there's cash in our name and we used to promote that okay sell your phone and get cash now there's no cash okay and 
to 80% of our customers were actually opting for cash in hand before that night and we had a big dilemma now how to navigate that there are there were two aspects one how do we convince people going forward that cashify will be able to give you money in the alternate forms it's not cash the second was the devices that we buy we had to sell them somewhere you know a lot of people ask me okay mandeep great cashify buys the devices what do you do with them of course we refurbish and sell them we are not going to keep stashing those devices somewhere now the the immediate threat was that we had a huge pile of inventory lying in our warehouses and there's no buyer in the market because imagine if you don't have money what do you do you buy you know food to eat you buy basic necessities mobile phones become the last priority although it is also an essential commodity today but it you know people won't choose choose to buy a mobile phone at that point so that was a big challenge uh, and for almost a month month and a half suddenly the demand side of our business became zero and you have expenses you know as a founder you need to keep the ball rolling you you have fixed expenses that you just can't do away with and incidentally we were at a stage we were also trying to raise capital at that point so it was a double whammy that suddenly all the term sheets had vanished all the investor you know wallets were shut nobody knew which side the camel would sit so we were in a bad state but i think what we knew was it is a positive step from the fact that at least now we don't have to manage cash so a lot of our uh, you know operations uh, was very difficult because we had to dole out cash to customers so all our riders used to carry cash we had to make you know frequent visits to atm so all all of that would stop so there is a lot of operational efficiency that would come in okay so we knew that at least it's good for business in the long term if we survive these 2 3 months hopefully we will be able to solve for it and thankfully what happened after that is a lot of digital adoption happened a lot of people you know who did not have a, f- a smartphone wanted to buy a smartphone because you could only do payments via you know the wallets and digital you know formats so a lot of that happened and after a initial lull of 1 1 and a half months or 2 months we started seeing the demand come back up and actually demand was much much larger than what we could have anticipated because everybody now wanted to use a wallet for for transactions so it was a tough time it was you know given that we had a very little runway we were raising capital and suddenly the demand side vanished and we were sitting with inventory and re- you know smartphone is not an appreciating commodity anyways you know every day it's lying with you the value decreases so we were looking at you know something where we did not know where it's going to go but thankfully things came back in two months and we survived wow what a story and i think there's a book in there somewhere <laughs> uh so you've done everything right you've you've done pivots you've you've built a category you're still growing the category i think you're building a playbook for a lot of other categories here uh you've raised lots of money and probably you'll raise a lot more what are things that stand out as learnings as a founder for you mandeep what are things that that probably are two three massive takeaways if you were to do this all over again or if you were to sit down with a fellow founder and tell them you know look here are three things i want to tell you i think uh, you know if i go back 15 years uh you know there are there are the basics which everybody will tell you that you know find a great team find a co-founder that you know you can gel with work with because that's important this journey is very lonely if you try to do it alone and there would be times when you would just want to pull the plug multiple times so having someone by your side is important so having a great founder is is very important and i'm thankful that i have to really good great founder but these are basics everybody would tell you i think what i think my biggest learning is that we always think you know the scale that which we think about uh when while we are building our businesses is a function of our growing up years you know we all you know grow up in a certain kind of setup and we all are limited by the scale 
that we can think of or what we see around us. And I think that's something that's very, very important for founders to realize and understand that you have to think beyond. And I remember in 2008, eight nine, we did not even know the word venture capital. We did not think that VCs exist for us. We've just, we've, we'd always seen that if you want to build something, go to a bank, bank will give you a loan. And the amount of loan that you're going to get is, you know, what you can actually go and ask them for or your, what your business plans are. And I think we realize a lot of, you know, the middle class generation, you know, the middle class people who've built businesses have always, you know, thought of smaller outcomes. And if somebody had told me back then that you can think of a billion dollar enterprise, all you need to do is just think large and go to a venture capital guy and show them a vision, you may get the money. I think the ball would have been really different the way we would have, you know, approached, uh, you know, how we built our career would be very different. Back then, I think I remember just thinking of a hundred crore top line business was wow. But today, now when I think about it, 100 crore business, of course, it's large. A lot of people, you know, build successful 100 crore businesses and happy with it. But you should think of multi-billion dollar businesses. And I think that's one thing that I want to, you know, give as an advice to everyone who wants to start. Just don't limit your thoughts around scale by what you see around you in your, in your local setup. Think beyond. If you think 10 just dare to think about 100 or 1000. And I've seen that up close uh, with our counterparts in China. You know, the first time we visited a similar business in China, they were doing 20x of what we were doing at that point. And that just opened our eyes because, you know, when we were thinking about our business planning, we were like, if we do 10x, wow, we've built a great company. But here is a company who's doing 20x right now. So you need to think larger, bigger. So that is one thing that I want to, you know, give as an advice to everyone that, uh, you know, we need to think large. Capital is available. It is available. You just have to, you know, knock on the right doors and you'll get it. I think all of us wish we could go back in time and make better decisions with the knowledge we have now. However, while time travel may not be possible currently, Dell for Startups helps startups reach their goals and defines new routes for their success. With Dell's core purpose of creating technologies that drive human progress, they help startups in India accelerate their digital journey and solve some of the biggest challenges in the country. Let's head back to Startup Dugout by Dell Technologies to find out more about Mandeep Manocha, what he learned from his obstacles and his plans for the future. Mandeep, this brings me to my next question, which is, and you mentioned growing up years, and uh, founder make companies, but I'm always curious what made the founder. And uh, so walk us through a little bit about your own journey. Uh, what are the events that made you? Where did you grow up? A little bit of your own personal space and uh, uh, you know situations that made you. Well, I think uh, really going back to formative years, I think uh, I come from a, f a family where both parents were working and I had a little sister. So very early on, the sense of, uh, you know, maturity just came in that you need to take care of the household or your younger sibling when the parents are not around. And when I look back, I think that was one of the most important, uh, you know, educations that I got from the family circumstance or setup that you got to be independent and uh, you have to fend for yourself or for the you know the larger part of the day and that's that's something that you know created who i am today in terms of being very very independent from day one the second thing is i always uh, you know my father made sure that you know i'm surrounded by people who who are some way associated with businesses now uh, i remember him taking me to you know many of his friends who were in businesses uh, making me sit in business meetings while I was in school. And uh, very early on, I realized when I reached a business school that the terms that these guys are teaching us right now is something that I, I had heard like while growing up. So when I look back, I think those are very important uh, lessons that were taught growing up. 
exposure to businesses exposure to how you know you build large uh, thinking processes is what i got from there and when i reached college uh, the kind of friends that i had we used to you know at night discuss about business plans atrocious business plans of hundreds of crores while we had not even a few thousand rupees in our pocket but we loved chatting about it and i think that's that's what built you know uh, uh, the thought process that okay we need to or i need to build something of my own at some point and uh, the other thing that i mentioned that you know uh, having an exposure to scrap yards which instilled the sense of recycling uh, giving me exposure that you know waste is not waste it's it's a resource and not a lot of people think of waste as a resource and uh, that those were you know few of the growing up nuances uh, but i think i really uh, enjoyed you know growing up in a in a very small town uh, called faridabad uh, which is right next to delhi and uh, yeah that's 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 about it fascinating i think uh, you know how the dots connect in hindsight and yeah. how everything yeah. has a purpose in your life and yeah. amazing and this brings me to my next question and my last question on this chat mandeep you've clearly created a category company and i think the companies that create categories also create ecosystems they they germinate a lot of ideas in other people and clearly uh, you guys are making a massive contribution to the circular economy to the larger mission of climate change uh, walk us through what what lies ahead especially what role do you see cashify playing in this larger ecosystem of environment and climate sure. change sure i think the first step uh, for us is making sure that all the devices which are lying unused in people's homes to come out and be part of the circular economy and as per our estimates about 80 85% of devices which can potentially be brought out and reused again are just lying in people's drawers so i think the first step that we you know we we've, we've identified as that we need to educate people that you you need to bring those devices out because otherwise we are just going to put more pressure on the environment and extract more resources to create new stuff so let's reuse whatever is lying with us extend the life cycle as much as possible ultimately everything needs to be recycled now as cashify we have plans of also getting into recycling at some stage uh because we believe that whatever we bring out from the drawers extend life and refurbish them and sell them but still there would be an end of life but for the next one or two years three years we'll focus on bringing these devices out and post that we also want to set up a recycling setup of our own because we would ultimately know where we've sold these devices who are the customers and we can reach out to them and you know collect those devices back and recycle them responsibly i think we need as a society we need to be very very cognizant of the fact that you know we are wasting a lot of resources uh we are consuming a lot but one thing i learned very early on that you can't ask people to stop consuming they will consume but you need to change the way that people consume and there are a lot of design hacks product hacks through which you can actually influence the consumption patter without telling them that you should stop consuming because trust me everybody is entitled to a good way of life and people will consume and a very you know a, an example which is closest to my heart when i think about uh, the design led approach of changing consumption is how you know uh, some of the toothpaste brands change how we consume the amount of toothpaste that we consume every day they just change the so nose you know size of the nozzle through which we squeeze out the toothpaste it's such a simple way of just increasing how you know you have to increase the consumption but if you think about these kind of approaches and design to reduce consumption as well it's possible and i think that's how you know we want to uh, you know impart that kind of philosophy in our in our company uh, staying true to recycling from from that perspective so we will make sure that most of the devices come out and we will invest heavily in recycling going forward wonderful more power to you mandeep and more power to cashify and keep keep building this up we all need it and we have only one planet to live on absolutely it's been wonderful chatting with you and thank you for joining us that was mandeep manocha co-founder and ceo of cashify 
on Startup Dugout by Dell Technologies. Tune in next week for more insights, stories of overcoming challenges, and of course, never giving up. If you are an entrepreneur that's forging your path with your dreams, Dell for Startups can help you in your digital journey and transformation. For more details, check out the links in the episode description.